Hi everyone, FIDE Master Dennis Montecruz is here for ChessLecture.com and today I'm going to start a series maybe straight through, maybe occasional, but it's going to be on the Queen's Gambit and Friends as I put it. And the reason why I say that is because one thing you'll notice in chess, if you haven't already, is that while certain openings have certain characteristic pawn structures, those pawn structures aren't necessarily exclusive to a given opening. Sometimes you'll end up with very, very similar structures or even identical structures in other openings. So from time to time, I may bring in another opening, which will illustrate a pawn structure that we've looked at in a Queen's Gambit. So there will be some interplay of that sort. But by and large, we'll focus on the Queen's Gambit. Now, some of you may be less than overwhelmed about that because it's a classical opening and it can seem to be a bit dry. But in fact, this is not the case. The Queen's Gambit is a, a wonderfully diverse opening and it's possible, very possible, for both sides to play for a win. As we'll see, we're going to start with some slightly older games, but this is true of the present day as well. In fact, Anand won the World Championship against Topalov with one of the most supposedly stodgy openings in existence, the, uh, the Lasker defense. So that used to be considered for many, many decades to be something really dry, that Black would only play to try to draw a game. And in fact, that game ended up being very sharp, the final game of his match with Topalov. And he won when Topalov got a bit frisky, but it was a very complicated game even before that. Furthermore, they played a second Queen's Gambit decline game later that year after the match, and Anand with Black won in beautiful style. So that's just one example of Black winning in, in theoretically one of the, uh, the driest of variations. So it's not dry at all. And of course, the Queen's Gambit is a huge complex. I mean, it includes the Slav and the Semi-Slav. The Queen's Gambit accepts the Queen's Gambit declined, the Tarash, and many other systems. So as we go through this, and again, it won't be so much systematic as uh, some highlights, both of different structures, of, of, of great games, and, and of, of the variations in general, I think you'll have, uh, I hope you'll have an increased appreciation for not only the richness of, of the opening, but of how to play the thing as well, which is really the, um, well, the, the, the biggest bottom line that we're after here. But certainly I, I want to uh, offer you games and, and variations that will, will uh, also be just entertaining and, and, um, and aesthetically pleasing. All right, so this first game we're going to take a look at is um, a game which, had it been played in one sense about a year earlier, might have changed chess history. So um, we're going to take a look at a game played in the, uh, the Tartikover variation, which for many years was the main line of the Queen's Gambit decline. So the game we're going to take a look at was played in 1973 between Jan Timmen, who went on to be one of the world's best players for a couple of decades, and F.M. Geller, who had been one of the world's best players from the, the early 1950s, really through at least a good chunk of the 1970s. And in fact, in 1978, I think it was, maybe 79, he won the Soviet championship in uh, his kind of late middle age. So Geller was a great, great player. He not only was a player who came pretty close to, to fighting for the world championship, but was also, importantly, a second to many great players, most notably Karpov, in the, uh, in the 70s. But before that, he was also a second for Boris Spassky. And he was a second for Spassky in Spassky's match against Fischer. And the amazing thing is in the variation we're going to see, Gellert had prepared what we're going to look at, what he did to Jan Timmen, had prepared this for Spassky, and Spassky just very strangely decided to avoid this preparation, lost a great game to Fischer, and that was fairly early in the match when the tide was really turning. So let's jump in and, and have a look at all of this, and you'll see it's quite interesting. So this game, well, both the uh, the Fischer Spassky and, and Tim and Geller games um, start like this. Actually, Fischer played c4 on move one, but of course, it's very quickly going to transpose. All right, Bishop to e7 is a, a little finesse designed to avoid the exchange Queen's Gambit decline lines where white plays Bishop g5 and Knight g to e2. So here, black is forcing white to either play Bishop f4 or Knight f3. Uh, I mean, you can play CD first or not, but but the point is it prevents the bishop g5, knight g to e2 combo. So knight f3, knight f6, bishop g5, 
vessels E3, H6, bishop H4, and B6. So this is the characteristic starting position of the Tartikover variation. And white has a lot of ways to play. The idea of the Tartikover, and indeed of many lines of the Queen's Gambit decline, is that black is trying to solve the problem of his light squared bishop. You know, what do you do with this guy? Because once you play E6 on move two, you've, you've shut it in. So we've got to figure out how do we get this guy into play. So this is one very simple way of doing it. We want to put the bishop on b7. Sooner or later, these pawns will be exchanged, and the bishop will have a great diagonal. So white has various ways of trying to combat this. And one rather popular approach nowadays, and for some time, is bishop to e2. Let's say bishop to, to b7. And now to take and then to take. So black does not want to play bishop d5 because white will take, and then thanks to the pawn being on b6, black will have various weak light squares. So you play ed, but then, hmm, what's this bishop doing on b7? Now all of a sudden, it would be much better off back on c8, where you can go to e6, f5, or g4. So that's one very common approach. It's a fixed center approach. Uh, another kind of typical move here is bishop to d3. In fact, Kramnik played this against Andraken in, um, I think, in, in uh, the final of the, what was it called, the World Cup this uh, past August, and he won that game. Not because bishop to d3 is some kind of brand new amazing move, it's just um, one of the important choices for white. Okay, in our game, or games, white played c takes d5. Now, black gets to achieve another of his typical goals here, he wants to trade off some minor pieces, and thereby uh, leave the cramp. So black's got a bit less space. All things being equal, he wants to, to swap. The difference now, though, is that black does not play bishop to b7 next, but plays bishop to e6. And so he didn't have to lose the tempo on bishop to b7. So that's, that's kind of the idea there. All right. Now, here white plays queen to b3, I think, a bit more often nowadays. But rook c1 is very logical. And well, the idea is to put pressure here. And now black plays bishop b6. By the way, you might wonder, because I said before, in this position, back a little bit, I had said that after bishop b2, bishop b7, bishop f6, bishop f6, cd, black would not want to play bishop takes d5, because after this exchange, he would have to worry about these kind of weak light squares over here. Well, so going back to the game position, we had here, why is this any better? You know, okay, the bishop's um, still abandoning all of these squares. Well, it can be weak. So the the, the uh, answer, part one, is that it can indeed be weak, but it's not as weak because you still have the bishop. So the bishop could still fight for those weak light squares that it needs to. So yes, the bishop is um, slightly abandoning the queen side, but not permanently. It can always jump back. Furthermore, uh, black aims to play c5. Now, if there's no bishop, if that light squared bishop is gone, then the d5 pawn will be quite weak. I mean, white would just play dc and then queen d5, and that would be that. But because there's the bishop on e6, that's more stable. And if the pawn can get safely to c5, then it's much more difficult for white to take advantage of those weakened light squares. All right, so that's kind of how we get to this point. Now, the main move here is queen to a4, and it has a very interesting idea. It's not just that it directly eyes these squares, which it does, but there's a, a clever follow-up, which is that after c5, white plays queen to a3. It's very important for white to put pressure on these hanging pawns. Well, they're not hanging yet, but let's say this exchange takes place. The pawns on c5 and d5 are what are called hanging pawns. It's like a pair of isolated pawns, except they're together. So it's, it's a little two-pawn island, generally on the fifth rank, if it's black, fourth rank, if it's white. And if these two pawns can safely stay, stay side by side, they can be very strong because they control a lot of squares right in front of them. So pawns on c5 and d5 are controlling b4, c4, d4, and e4, which is great. I mean, very important squares. On the other hand, if, if they advance, then they can prove to be kind of weak because you can blockade both of them. So if the pawn goes to, if, if you have pawns on c5 and d4, white can blockade the light squares. If d5 and c4, then you blockade on the dark squares. So that's kind of the uh, the theory behind this. If they can stay side by side, they can often have a lot of dynamic potential and control a lot of squares. If they advance, then you can end up with this rather sickly and brittle structure. 
All right, so queen a3 attacks the pawn, and of course there's this pin, so he can't play c4, which sometimes could be good, but often is, uh, is not fantastic. It depends on the position. One game that you might want to take a look at along those lines where c4 was a good move is the famous game Burtok against Fisher from the Stockholm Interzonal in 1962. Great game by Fisher. All right, so here black plays rook c8, defending the pawn again. Now, sometimes bishop to e2 is played, but I believe it was Seymour Furman, who's a strong uh, Soviet grandmaster and uh, kind of a father figure to Anatoly Karpov, really um, uh, a huge influence on uh, Karpov's chess um, as when, when he was a young man. Uh, Furman was known as the world champion with the white pieces and uh, was just full of great ideas with white, as you would imagine, in, um, in the D-pawn openings in particular. And this was one of his ideas. And he, uh, he beat Geller in a game in 1970. So this game that we're looking at was played in 73. Of course, Fischer Spassky was 72. And um, I think Geller, or sorry, Furman introduced this idea in, um, in 70. Now, in both the, uh, the, the Furman-Geller game and the Fischer Spassky game, Black played a6, not allowing the bishop to stay there, or at least trying to eliminate its its uh, unpleasant influence. So in those games, white played dc5, bc5. Now we have the hanging pawns, white castle, rook a7. So now the queen defends the rook, so the pawn threatens the bishop. So it's breaking the pin. White played bishop to e2. And now, in the earlier game, Geller played a5, which is a standard idea. Often it's continued, it's followed up by uh, with c4, and then black will try to put pressure against b2. But uh, it was a little slow, and, and Furman managed an advantage. After rook c3, knight to d7, rook f to c1, uh, rook e8, defending the rook queen, and then bishop to b5, white was clearly better. So you can see a lot of pressure against this pawn on c5 in particular. And again, if you ever play c4, then there'd be a trade and maybe knight to d4 or, or b3 and then try to penetrate. Uh, in the game, Geller played bishop to g4. And here, uh, white played knight to d2 and eventually won, but that was a mistake. Um, rook to c5 was a very good tactical continuation. Black's counterplay on the king side would be insufficient and uh, white would just be up a pawn with a great position. So that is um, that was the stem game. Now, Fosti instead of a5 played the move knight to d7. And here, Fisher played just a, a brilliant game, probably his best game of the match, and, and won in great style. So this game went knight to d4, taking advantage of the pin once again on this poor c-pawn. Spassky played queen f8, and now Fisher transformed the structure. He played a takes e6, f takes e6, and e4. And it turned out that Black's position was just full of weaknesses, and, and Fisher went on to win just a fantastic game. Just to give a few more moves, Spassky played d4, and, I mean, you can see, I mean, it just looks bad. f4, queen e7, e5, rook to b8, bishop c4, and white's position just looks absolutely beautiful. It's clearly better here. Uh, these pawns are just firmly blockaded. They're going nowhere. This pawn on e6 is obviously weak. White has great chances on the king side, and he just managed to, uh, to just squeeze him to death all over the board. I mean, it was a fantastic win by Fisher. The full game is, of course, in the PGN, as is the full Furman-Geller game that I mentioned, too. Now, let's get back to, to uh, the branching off point. So here, as I said, A6 was played in the Furman-Geller and Fisher-Sposky games, but Geller had prepared an innovation, and he told Sposky about it, and incredibly, Sposky didn't play it. So it was good news for Geller. I mean, Geller was able to use it himself, but it would have been much better for for them as as countrymen to uh, to have played the better move in the match and, and kept it an exciting match because once Fisher won this game, it was game six. He took the lead in the match and just continued to roll roll Sposky over before Sposky kind of dug in and managed to make a fight. Uh, well, didn't manage to make a fight of the match, but managed to um, make a fight of the games. I mean, that became a good close battle, but only once the score was almost out of reach. So what was Geller's great idea? Well, what he played 
against him. It was queen to b7, breaking the pin and putting uh, another heavy piece on the queen side, on, on the soon-to-be-open b file. So it's very, very logical. The only question is, well, gee, what about the c-pawn? So that's the key question. If, if um, white doesn't take the c-pawn, then black is just in fantastic shape. It plays c4 and a6 and b5. Um, among other possibilities, or just C takes D5, D4 right now um, with White's king in the center. Of course, if, if he castles, then C4 looks like at least one good option of, of several. So the only crucial way to play here is D takes C5, D C5, Rook C5, Rook C5, Queen C5. And here, it's not immediately evident what Black's big idea is. I mean, he doesn't have much development, and if White can just make a couple of moves, let's say castles, maybe put the knight on D4. He's going to have a fantastic position, just a winning position, up a pawn with a superior structure and, you know, this monster blockade on d4. So black has to act fast, and of course he does. Knight a6. Now, this again may not look like such a big deal. Okay, we're developing a piece, but the, here's the key thing. If you play bishop a6, then after queen a6, white cannot castle. So, you know, he's just a tempo away. Again, if White could have castled already, the game would almost be over. I mean, White would just have a strategically won position and a pawn up. But, well, I shouldn't say strategically won, but with the extra pawn, it becomes a winning. So that's part one. Okay, part two, if Queen C6, then just takes, takes, and to B8. And Black gets his material back and, in fact, stands better. I think there have been five or six games that have reached this position in the database. White drew two of them, black won four. So again, it might look completely innocuous. It might seem bizarre to think that this should be anything but a draw at best for black, but this is not the case. So if the, the black rook comes in, then he's in great shape. And if b3, the knight to b4 is rather unpleasant, of course, he can take. Maybe knight to, uh, to d3 check ideas show up as well. And okay, if the bishop has to go to a4, it's Pretty stupid piece there. So you can take um, maybe knight c3 and take some rook b4. So black black has a, an edge here, and it's been enough for him to win some games. Okay, so that's queen c6, and in the game, Timon found nothing better than to take. So takes, takes, and black not only threatens or prevents castling, but threatens to play rook c8, followed by rook c1, and he's also threatening the a pawn. So Queen a3 is a, a, a very reasonable looking move, offering a trade, protecting the a-pawn, and getting out of the way of rook c8 in advance. All right, Geller plays queen c4, threatening to win on the spot with queen c1, so king to d2. And again, if you give white one more move, maybe, rook c1, or even better, maybe knight to d4, then he's okay. Then the knight kind of glues everything together, and because yeah, it covers the c2 square, it... Uh, well, it prevents some things that we'll see. I don't want to necessarily uh, give away what's going to happen, but it's um, the knight on d4 would be excellent, and white would be all right then. So black has to play actively, and of course this was all part of preparation. Queen g4. So the threat is just to take on, on g2. Obviously g3 is no good because it hangs the knight. Knight to e1 would be kind of bad as it shuts the rook in on h1, and uh, black will probably just play uh, d4 in that case. So white plays rook to g1, and again he's hoping to play knight to d4 and just kind of tidy everything up, and then he'll be okay. But again, Giller's active play does not allow it. He plays d4, another very, very good move here. So white is just not given a chance to breathe. If e takes d4, then rook c8. And now covering the c2 square is not so easy because there's no knight swinging to d4 any longer. So there are ideas like queen f4 check, and if the king goes to the back rank, then rook c1 happens. If king e2, then rook c2 check. If king d3, there's bishop f5 check. So this is this is already pretty difficult. Black is clearly better here. Okay, so Timon plays knight takes d4, which is what he always wanted to do, but two things are different. First of all, the bishop is not going to be blocked in by the pawn on d5 now. Secondly, just for an instant, White has a couple of loose pawns here. So queen h4 is going to regain one of the pawns and keeps the initiative going. Well, if white plays king to e1, trying to bring the king back to safety, then takes. If the rook moves, then black re-establishes material equality. So if rook f1, then queen g2. 
And okay, bishop c4. Actually, yeah, sorry, if rook f1, just bishop c4, I think it's even more accurate. But even aside from that, queen g2 and the h pawn will be quite a force as well. So knight to f3 would be the uh, way to go here. But now after queen c7, white is has not consolidated at all. The knight has left the good d4 square. The rook on g1 is still blocked in by the king, and the king is still kind of vulnerable. And after um, queen c7, queen c3 is forced. Queen c1 check is the threat. So queen c3, queen b7, preparing rook c8, knight to d4, rook c8, and um, black is a little bit better here. Or you can even play bishop takes a2, just read the material straight away with an advantage. So he's got the superior minor piece and, of course, the safer king. So let's get back to the game. Instead of king to e1, Timon tried rook to e1. Black played rook takes f2, which is not bad, but maybe bishop c4 is even better so that there's no rook to e2 block after queen f2. So here, white is in serious trouble. So maybe not quite the perfect move here by Geller, but still, uh, Black's initiative is very long-lasting. And, okay, it's one thing to, to see what a computer would do, but for humans, it's a different matter altogether, and it's just very, very tough for White to, uh, to survive this. And it's, it's uh, again, kind of an ongoing, long-lasting suffering that White will have to endure. And this reminds me quite strongly of a game that I mentioned already, uh, Tapalov against Anand, from Nanjing in 2010. So not from the World Championship, but Nanjing. It, it might be a game that we'll look at later. I, I haven't decided, but certainly it's a game that is worth your investigating. Okay, so after Queen F2, Rook E2, Queen F6 is pretty good here. F1 is certainly not bad, as played by, by Geller. And Timon exchanges off the, the minor pieces. And at one level, it makes sense to do so because the Black Bishop is very dangerous. And then we go back and move here. I mean, it's threatening to, to, to just go to c4, which will pretty nearly win the game on the spot. Uh, bishop g4 is also quite annoying. And, um, you know, so it's a position where white has to make very unpleasant choices no matter what. So he traded and then played queen d6, since rook to d8 was, a, a, well, it would have been a winning move if black could have just played it straight away. All right, and he not only, of course, blocks the file, but threatens queen e6. So black plays king h8, just calmly getting out of the way. And here, too, even though white is up a pawn, and he's not going to lose that extra pawn anytime soon, and there's no immediate threats, the white position is still incredibly difficult to hold. So he played e4 to Timon, rook c8, making possible already some ideas with queen c1. In some cases, maybe rook c1 also. So there isn't any threat of perpetual check by white at this point, so rook c1 very certainly comes into consideration as well. So Timon plays king to e3, which is kind of interesting, and perhaps one idea is to meet queen c1 by king f2, and maybe the king can even escape with g3 and king g2, should that happen. Okay, rook f8, not allowing that. Rook to d2, and now a very nice move, e5. So this creates a new anchor point for, for the black pieces, f4. It also closes the queen's um, access to the king side. And the problem for white is that if queen e5, which is what happens, then it opens up some more lines. So I think at this point, white is not losing. I mean, again, if you can uh, just switch on your engine, if you're playing a tournament game, then you're going to be okay here with white. But in, in real life, where you can't do that, it's, it's too difficult for just about anybody to survive such a position and uh, Timon did not succeed in doing so. He took the pawn, and now black is clearly winning. Queen e1 check. King d3 is impossible because of rook to d8. So the only move not to lose the rook is rook to e2. All right, now queen to g1 check. Of course, rook f2 is impossible, so the king has to go to the d-file. Rook d8 check. Uh, here, king to c2 is just a blunder because of queen d1, and then the rook drops. So king to c3. And now queen to d1 anyway still attacking the rook, which doesn't have many squares. If it goes to f2, then queen e1 check and wins it right away. If rook e3, then queen e d2 check wins it straight away. Um, what else is there? If you go to c2, then rook c8. So that means that queen to b5, or some other way to defend the rook, is the only try that white has left. But now, 
Geller finishes things off nicely. Queen to d4 check, king c2, and now a very nice move by Geller, a6. And the point of this is that the white queen is really stuck. It has to stay on this diagonal because otherwise either queen d3 or queen d1 wins the rook. So he plays queen takes a6, but now black's queen gains access to a very important square. Queen c5 check, and here it was time for Tim to throw in the towel. Blocking with the queen is, of course, pointless. You just take it, you're up a queen, and you're going to mate next move. If king to b1, rook to d1 is mate. And finally, if king to b3, then rook to b8 check. And, okay, if white doesn't just waste a move by throwing with the queen, he plays king a4, and the queen to b4 is checkmate. So, a great game by Giller, and a fantastic novelty. Again, it's a, it's a pity for chess history, certainly for Spassky fans, that Spassky somehow didn't try this against Fisher. Maybe he wouldn't have won, but he certainly would have had Fisher on the ropes there for a while. And it was kind of interesting. I mean, Spassky really missed some opportunities early in the match. So in game four, he was winning in a Sicilian. In game six, he could have had him really pushed against the wall in this way. So, you know, it's the what-if game. Certainly Fisher, I think, was the stronger player. But anything could have happened if Spassky had, had stayed strong in the match mentally and had really uh, managed to take advantage of his opportunities, both on the board and in preparation. At any rate, we can see, just to switch back to our main topic here, the Queen's Gambit can be a very exciting opening, and both sides can get really, you know, tremendous play. It's uh, about knowledge, but you get these very imbalanced positions, so it's about the knowledge that you've got, and not necessarily memorizing a bunch of stuff, but you, you see these ideas, these themes, these pawn structures, you get used to them, and over time, it gives you the ability, the ability to play both sides. And as we're going to see next time, it gives you the ability to play other openings where you have similar structures. So I hope you guys enjoyed this game, and I hope this series will improve your chess and, of course, let you see some really great, entertaining games, too. So until next time, this is Fide Master, Dennis Monacrucis, signing off for ChessLecture.com. Bye-bye.